I guess my mindset was like this whole space is about permissionless innovation, so like why the hell should I go and like ask yeah. some centralized academic to leave for permission? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so just I know that this can be a long answer, but we can just do it quickly. So what what does Ethereum do that Bitcoin doesn't do or enable you to do? So the idea is that Ethereum has a much more expressive uh, programming language that's embedded inside of the protocol. So every Ethereum node understands this programming language. And this programming language allows you to encode arbitrarily complex rules for how you can create these objects that we call contracts and how users can send transactions in order to interact with them and how the, does a transaction that gets sent to a particular contract to a change of state, what happens if you send different transactions in different orders and so forth. And using this scripting language as a kind of basic building block, you can do pretty much any application that can be expressed through sort of simple business logic. So like, if you want, think of something like a currency, the business logic for that is actually pretty simple. You have accounts, everyone has an account balance, and there is one function called send. And the function called, called send takes two arguments. One of them is who you're sending the money to. One of them is how much money you're sending. And the code does two things. First, it checks, do you have enough money? If not, it throws an error and does nothing. And the second is, if you do have enough money, then it subtracts the money from your account and adds the money to or whatever account you're sending to. So like, that's basically the business logic for like, what a currency is. And like, for many different kinds of applications, you can just boil it down into a set of rules and code the rules in the uh, smart contracts code and there you have it if you're in that location. Okay, so this is a financial industry audience. So, uh, except what you said, that this is a, a new platform, a, a native digital medium for value that could lead to all kinds of applications, not just money. But let's talk about money for a second. So you got the banking industry, and what do banks do? I mean, they, they help us authenticate and identify parties, they settle and clear transactions, they keep records, mm -hmm. they move money, they store money, because they store money, they get to lend money or value, uh -huh. um, and then they exchange value, you got stuff like stock markets, they can invest value, the whole banking, investment banking industry, and then they account for an auto value, like accounting right. returns. So, arguably, a new native digital medium for value could kind of wipe all of that out. So are the banks toast? French toast. <laughs> French toast. <laughs> Is that your Canadian connection there? No. The French? No, no, no. <laughs> um, so I mean, seriously speaking though, I think uh, banks definitely are going to have to change. And even independently of blockchain technology, there's a lot of technological innovation, a lot of disruption that's uh, just necessarily going to happen. And if you don't adapt, you're going to die, basically. So I think, uh, there, but at the same time, there are a lot of interesting things that are happening in the blockchain space, and I feel like it has been a kind of important catalyst in making uh, the uh, financial industry rethink how a lot of their applications are done. Like, I feel like you can think of it as being almost like a fusion of uh, traditional finance and the way that things are done in the way the software development. So, you know, where countries and said software is eating the world while well, it's set. Uh, poking its head into the, into the financial world as well. And, and the yeah, interesting thing is how if you in, start rethinking uh, these financial systems, at, I mean, both as software systems and also just think about them from the point of view of, like, soft, of uh, software industry norms and software industry perspectives. Like for example, you know, if you tried to make a system where if you want to send an email across borders, you have to like fill out KYC forms and it takes five days and, and uh, the last five percent of the message gets dropped off as a feed, people are going to ride it. So I think it's uh, that uh, kind of uh, fusion bet uh, uh, between the two is uh, going to create a lot of uh, interesting effects. And like I do, I do think that both sides like have their own value perspectives. Like I feel like it's. Uh, the, at the same time, you know, like me actually upgrading um, systems that are designed around like every single actor having, having its own ledger and having to reconcile them every single day and so forth. And these systems have evolved over the last one or two hundred years back before the uh, information technology needed to facilitate the more efficient and decentralized approaches even existed. Like those need to be replaced, but at the same time, there's obviously people who have experience in understanding what are the financial needs of today 
needs of uh, businesses and individuals of today, and they do have to be part of the conversation. So when it comes to wither the bands, I mean, this is one of these, uh, you know, the future is not something to be predicted, it's something to be achieved. It really depend, depends on what they do. And there's an obvious opportunity here. I mean, I think of the financial system as like Rube Goldberg.